Hi, understanding the anatomy of the brachial plexus is the first step to understanding anything about the brachial plexus. We shall make an attempt to understand not only the structural anatomy but also the functional, clinical and surgical anatomy of the brachial plexus. The plexus supplies all sensory innervation to the upper limb and most of the axilla with the exception of an area on the medial upper arm and axilla which is supplied by the intercostobrachial nerve T2. It also supplies all motor innervation of the muscles of the upper limb and the shoulder girdle except of course the trapezius which is supplied by the spinal accessory nerve. The autonomic innervation that is the vasomotor, pilomotor and pseudomotor fibers to the upper limb are also supplied by the brachial plexus. The plexus is formed by the anterior primary rami of the cervical spinal nerve C5, C6, C7 and C8 and the first thoracic spinal nerve T1. Spinal nerve is formed by two main components, the ventral root and the dorsal root. The ventral root or the anterior root arises from the anterior horn of the spinal cord and consists mainly of motor fibers that ultimately end in the skeletal muscles. They also contain the sympathetic nerve fibers and to a very small extent the parasympathetic nerve fibers. The dorsal root emerges as multiple rootlets from the posterior part of the spinal cord and travels to the dorsal root ganglion. The lateral division of the dorsal root contains highly myelinated and unmyelinated fibers of small diameter which carry pain and temperature. The medial division of the dorsal root contains myelinated fibers of larger diameter which carry discriminative touch, pressure, vibration and proprioception. As mentioned, the dorsal and ventral roots join to form the primary spinal nerve. This spinal nerve exits through the intervertebral foramen. In the cervical segment, the root exits cephalite to the corresponding cervical segment that is C5 root exits through the intervertebral foramen between C4 and C5 vertebra and so on. This way, C7 nerve exits between C6 and C7 vertebra. C8 nerve exits after the C7 segment between the C7 and T1 vertebra and T1 nerve exits after the T1 vertebra. These roots are supported by the denticulate ligaments which are stronger in C5-6 segment than C8-T1 segment. After exiting the foramen, the spinal nerve gives two main divisions the posterior ramus and the anterior ramus and two small divisions the grey ramus and the white ramus. The white rami contain the preganglionic sympathetic fibers whereas the grey rami communicants contain the postganglionic nerve fibers of the sympathetic nerves. Note the close proximity of the cervical sympathetic chain and specifically of the stellate ganglion to the C8 T1 level roots. The posterior primary rami innervate the skin and muscles of the back of the neck. The anterior rami are the ones that go on to contribute to and form the brachial plexus. The brachial plexus is divided into five parts, roots, trunks, divisions, cords and branches. A good mnemonic for this is read that damn cadaver book. This is a representation of the brachial plexus and we shall now see how this formation occurs. The anterior primary rami of spinal nerve C5, C6, C7, C8, T1 form the brachial plexus. Occasionally, the C4 may contribute or the T2 may contribute and are known as the prefixed or postfixed brachial plexus. These roots lie between the scalenus anterior and scalenus medius muscles. At the base of the neck, C5 and 6 roots join to form the upper trunk. The C7 continues as the middle trunk and C8 and T1 roots join to form the lower trunk. These trunks lie in the posterior triangle of the neck. The lower trunk lies exactly posterior to the subclavian artery and lies on the upper surface of the first rib. Each trunk divides approximately behind the middle third of the clavicle into two branches that is the anterior and posterior divisions. These continue to pass downwards behind the clavicle to enter the axilla. So we now have three anterior and three posterior divisions. They recombine into three cords named by their position relative to the axillary artery. The lateral cord is formed by the anterior division of the upper trunk and the anterior division of the middle trunk. 
The posterior cord is formed by the posterior division of the upper trunk, posterior division of the middle trunk and the posterior division of the lower trunk. The medial cord is formed by the extension of the anterior division of the lower trunk only. So far in the formation of the brachial plexus we have seen the roots, the trunks, the divisions, the cords. We shall now see the branches that arise from the brachial plexus, two from the roots, two from the trunks and seven branches from the cords and six terminal branches which arise also from the cords. As we see the branches, we will also be seeing where the fibers of these branches arise from. I shall be using red dotted lines to show motor fibers and green dotted lines to show sensory fibers. The dorsal scapular nerve has only motor fibers from C5 root. They supply the levator scapulae, rhomboidus major and minor muscles. The long thoracic nerve gets fibers only from C5, 6 and 7 and it has no sensory supply, only motor supply is to the serratus anterior muscle. The suprascapular nerve arises from the upper trunk with a root value of C5, 6. It gives sensory supply to the glenohumeral and acromioclavicular joints and motor supply is to the supraspinatus which stabilizes and abducts the shoulder and the infraspinatus which stabilizes and externally rotates the shoulder. The next branch from the upper trunk is the nerve to subclavius which has only a motor supply to the subclavius muscle. From the lateral cord we have one nerve branch that is the lateral pectoral nerve and two terminal branches the musculocutaneous nerve and the lateral root of the median nerve. Note the mnemonic LML. The lateral pectoral nerve has fibers arising from the root C5, 6 and 7. It is a purely motor nerve supplying the clavicular head of the pectoralis major muscle. The musculocutaneous nerve has both sensory and motor fibers all arising from C5, 6 and 7 roots. The sensory supply is to the lateral forearm through the lateral cutaneous nerve of the forearm. The motor supply is to the anterior compartment of the arm that is the biceps, the brachialis and the coracobrachialis. The other terminal branch of the lateral cord is the lateral root of the median nerve which contains mainly sensory fibers from C5, 6 and 7 roots. So if there is a lesion of C5, 6 and 7 roots, there is going to be loss of sensation on the median nerve distribution of the hand. Considering the branches from the posterior cord, there are three nerve branches, the upper subscapular, lower subscapular and the thoracodorsal nerve and two terminal branches, the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. Note the mnemonic ULTAR, the altar. The upper subscapular nerve is a motor nerve with fibers arising from C5 and C6 roots. It supplies the subscapularis muscle which stabilizes and internally rotates the shoulder. The lower subscapular nerve is also a motor nerve with fibers from C5 and C6. It supplies the subscapularis and the teres major which adducts and internally rotates the shoulder, protracts and depresses the scapula. The thoracodorsal nerve or the nerve to latissimus dorsi muscle is also a pure motor nerve with fibers arising from C6, 7 and 8 roots. The terminal branches of the posterior cord are the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. The axillary nerve has both sensory and motor fibers both arising from C5 and 6 nerve roots. The sensory supply of the axillary nerve is over the lower deltoid region known as the regiment patch. The motor supply is to the deltoid muscle which abducts the shoulder and the teres minor which stabilizes and externally rotates the shoulder. The other terminal branch of the posterior cord is the radial nerve. It receives fibers from all the roots of the brachial plexus. The motor supply from the radial nerve is to the posterior compartment of the arm that is the triceps mainly and then it supplies the entirety of the posterior compartment of the forearm consisting of the extensor muscles to the wrist, to the fingers and the thumb. The sensory supply from the radial nerve is to the posterior arm, forearm, lateral two-thirds of the dorsum of the hand and the proximal dorsal aspect of the lateral three and a half fingers. The medial pectoral nerve 
the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm are the three nerve branches from the medial cord. The two terminal branches are the medial root of the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. The medial pectoral nerve, like its counterpart the lateral pectoral nerve, is a pure motor nerve with fibers arising from C8 and T1 and supplies mainly the sternal part of the pectoralis major muscle. There are two cutaneous branches now arising from the medial cord, that is the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm which receives fibers from T1 nerve root and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm which receives fibers from C8 nerve root. One of the terminal branches of the medial cord is the medial root of the median nerve. This contains mainly motor fibers arising from C8 and T1 roots. Hence, the motor function of the median nerve is mostly derived from the medial root which comes from the medial cord. And we have already seen that the sensory fibers of the median nerve are derived from the lateral root of the median nerve which is a branch from the lateral cord. The median nerve supplies all the muscles of the anterior compartment of the forearm except the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial two parts of the flexor digitorum profundus. The median nerve also supplies the LOAF muscles of the hand that is the lateral two lumbricals, the opponent's pollicis, the abductor pollicis brevis and the flexor pollicis brevis. The ulnar nerve receives both sensory and motor fibers from C8 and T1 nerve roots. The sensory supply is mainly to the ulnar side of the palm and the dorsum of the hand. The motor supplied by the ulnar nerve is to two muscles in the anterior compartment of the forearm that is the flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial two parts of the flexor digitorum profundus. It also supplies the HIMA muscles in the hand that is the hypothenar muscles, the interosseae both palmar and dorsal, medial two lumbricals and the adductor pollicis. The brachial plexus is ultimately involved with function and this is what we have to understand. If we consider the upper trunk, the anterior one-third contain fibers for internal rotation of the shoulder, flexion of the elbow and sensibility of the thumb and index fingers brought about through the median and muscular cutaneous nerves. The posterior two-third contain fibers for abduction and external rotation of the shoulder brought about by the axillary and the radial nerves. Similarly, in the middle trunk, the anterior half contain fibers for internal rotation of the shoulder, pronation of the forearm, flexion of the wrist and sensibility of the index and middle fingers brought about by the median nerve and posterior half contain fibers for elbow, wrist and finger extension which is brought about by the radial nerve. Considering the distribution of fibers in the lower trunk, the anterior two-third is much more dominating which contains fibers for internal rotation of the shoulder, flexion and intrinsic function of the digits and sensibility of the ring and little fingers brought about by the ulnar and median nerves. The posterior one-third consists of fibers involved with extension of the thumb and sensibility of the dorsum of the thumb web which is brought about by the radial nerve. We also need an understanding of the brachial plexus with respect to the surgical aspect. The brachial plexus roots are within the interscalene triangle formed by the anterior scalene anteriorly, middle scalene posteriorly and the superior border of the first rib inferiorly. The brachial plexus trunks are located within the posterior triangle of the neck formed by the sternomastoid medially, trapezius laterally and the clavicle inferiorly. The scalenus anterior would have the phrenic nerve running on its surface. Following this nerve may sometimes lead us to C4 root which will give us a clue to finding the C5 root. The divisions of the brachial plexus lie behind the clavicle, the cords behind the pectoralis minor and nerves beyond the pectoralis minor. In avulsion and severe traction injuries we must remember that the whole plexus may migrate downwards and this has to be kept in mind while dissecting to identify the various structures. Another important surgical point is the position of the Chuang triangle which is actually the angle between the lower end of the lateral part of the clavicle and the deltopectoral groove where easy access to the cords of the brachial plexus can be obtained. Immediately distal to the cords an important anatomical landmark would be the M formation by the musculocutaneous nerve, ulnar nerve, 
and the median nerve which helps us to identify the different structures. Having learnt the anatomy of the brachial plexus, we need to know how to draw the brachial plexus now. First draw 5 points representing the 5 roots C5, C6, C7, C8 and T1. Draw and connect C5 and 6 and C8 and T1. Draw the roots now C5 and C6 joining together to form the upper trunk. Draw the root of C7 continuing at the middle trunk and draw the roots of C8 and T1 joining to form the lower trunk. Now draw the divisions, the upper trunk dividing into anterior and posterior divisions, the middle trunk dividing into anterior and posterior divisions and the lower trunk dividing into the posterior and anterior divisions. From here connect the two anterior divisions of the upper trunk and the middle trunk to form the lateral cord. Now draw and connect the three posterior divisions of the upper, middle and lower trunks to form the posterior cord. Then extend the line representing the medial cord which is going to represent the medial cord again. Now the lateral cord divides into two terminal divisions. The medial cord is also going to divide into two terminal divisions, the medial root of the median nerve and the ulnar nerve. Now the posterior cord is going to divide into two terminal divisions that is the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. Now the branches. The first branch is going to be the dorsal scapular nerve from C5 and then the long thoracic nerve arising from the roots of C5, C6 and C7 and passing posterior to the brachial plexus to supply the serratus anterior. Next branches from the trunk. From the upper trunk we are going to get the suprascapular nerve and the nerve to subclavius which arises from the upper trunk too. Next we go to the divisions. There are no branches in the divisions. In the lateral cord we get the LML that is the lateral pectoral nerve, musculocutaneous nerve and lateral root of the median nerve. From the posterior cord we have got two terminal divisions that is the axillary nerve and the radial nerve. We have got three other branches that is the ULT upper subscapular nerve, lower subscapular nerve and the thoracodorsal nerve. From the medial cord we get the medial pectoral nerve and then two cutaneous branches the medial cutaneous nerve of the arm and the medial cutaneous nerve of the forearm and the two terminal divisions of the medial cord the medial root of the median nerve and the ulnar nerve.